This is Scott Richmond and Arnie Sherman. You're listening to What Do You Know on News Talk KGVO, AM 1290 and 98.3 FM. Good morning and welcome to What Do You Know. Today is a special edition of What Do You Know where Arnie and I sit down with Missoula's 50th mayor, John Engen. Serving in that position since 2006, John has spent his whole life in Missoula where he grew up. Prior to serving as mayor, he was a member of the city council and was also an award-winning writer and editor for the Missoulian. He has owned a number of small businesses and worked for nonprofits. John is also an amateur auctioneer and MC, and as you'll see from our interview, he has a great style of communication. Re-elected in 2017, John Angan has a passion for the people and places in and around Missoula and Western Montana. We're pleased to present Mayor John Angan. Okay, we are here with Mayor John Angan. Good morning, Arnie. Good morning, Scott. Or I'd like, or as I'd like to call you, or as I think about you, John Mayor. <laughs> That's how I, I think of Mayor Engen. Well, well apart <laughs> apart from looks, yeah. talent, and resources, yeah, I'm I'm that guy, John yeah. the Mayor. So we're doing an end of the year kind of capitulation of Missoula as we're heading into 2019. What kind of uh, um, Postmortem, so to speak, for this year, would you would you give the city? Uh, you know, I I think we've had a good year as a community. Um, I think we've had uh, we've had successes and setbacks in municipal government. Um, I think we continue to do uh, the kind of planning and the kind of investment that will ensure that Missoula is a great place to live for a long time. As I was coming over here today, I stopped at, uh, at my office and talked to a few people and said, I'm going to be speaking to the mayor today. What would, what would you like to you know, ask him? And the same questions are being asked as when we did this last year and did it at the end of the year about things like snow removal on side streets, um, leaf cleanup, um, you know, potholes, anticipating potholes. And we've talked about that before, and that's a common theme, and it's a common theme with any city. But what's our status on those things that really are the irritants for a lot of folks? So, so that's that's retail mayoring, I call it, right? That's our bread and butter. Um, and so, a couple of things are afoot. One is uh, one is we we have recently undergone a reorganization of our public works department. Um, our street superintendent, Brian Hensel, is now a deputy public works director for transportation. So he's dealing with with all things streets. So it's, it's not just mm-hmm. pavement. He's dealing with signals. He's thinking about sidewalks. Um, he's thinking about stormwater and all of those integral parts of our um, street system. Uh, I just met with Brian this morning, um, and I, I will tell you that, uh, that uh, uh, Brian um, has been unleashed, and that's an inelegant way to suggest that he's been empowered to bring me ideas for how we do these things better. Uh, we just had a conversation across the street about the, the, the fact that um, in my experience in local government, we tend to do a lot of the things we do the same way we've always done them because mm-hmm. we were pretty lean um, and and reinvention uh, takes time and energy that sometimes takes away from matters at hand. And what I've asked Brian to do is think think about think about the work he's done during his career at the city of Missoula and talk to me about ways we can do things better. So today Brian brought me um, uh, another couple of ideas uh, for uh, snow removal, uh, a couple of opportunities we have to actually, um, Br- Brian's goal, if we can, if we can work through uh, some of the details, uh, is to ensure that, um, that we touch 
every side street, every residential street within 24 hours of what we call a snow event and what everybody calls, what everybody else calls snow. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's a, it's a critical issue for folks. Um, we don't, we don't have the staff to do that today, but Brian thinks he thinks he can come up with a, with a program and resources to help us do it. It's going to cost us more money, uh, but we think the investment will be worth it. And we think the investment will be, um, relatively low based on our return. So, and it is challenging, you know, for a small community because Weather, even in 2019, is writing into it, is still an imprecise science. You know, we're recording this on Thursday. Last night, there was going to be four or six inches of snow in Missoula. We needed, as a city, to prepare for that, right? And, of course, it didn't happen. Right. And so you, you have, you know, a, a, a misconnect often between what might be a snow event or a weather event and and the need to respond to it. But what we do, however, is so so our, our teams are interdisciplinary, right? So if if I've got a if I've got a plow operator who has nothing to plow, um, those folks are looking at other at other infrastructure and making repairs. Brian quoted me uh, a number for potholes <clears throat> this uh, this calendar year that was north of seven thousand potholes filled. Um, so we. You know, if, if it ain't snowing, we got we got other work for folks mm -hmm. to do, which is you know beautiful. Um, but when we're plowing, when we're plowing, we're not filling potholes. So right, that's that's the trade off there. Um, and you're right, weather uh, we are incredibly weather uh, sensitive in that department. And I will tell you, um, as mayor of the city of Missoula, uh, I don't like snow. Um, I'm, I'm done or, with it. Or ice. But, or ice, right. which is even a worse problem. Right. Um, I also have no control over that. What, what I have some control over is how we respond to it. And so, so Brian and his crew are going to cook up some new ideas for us, and we're going to test drive them. How do other cities in western Montana, like Kalispell, handle things like this? Are you, one of Brian's charges. I want to. I want to. I want to understand best practices from other jurisdictions, right. not just in Montana, but I'd like us to compare climates, um, cities with similar climates, mm -hmm. and understand what they're doing and how they're responding to well, snow. There's technology that some communities use. They use what are called. Uh, they use gates on plows. So, um, so when you get in front of a driveway, for example, you don't dump a burn. You're actually clearing that path. Right. You basically you're lifting and dropping. It takes more time. Um, it's a little more labor intensive, but you get a different product as you plow. And and that you know the, that stuff is deployed all over the place. And and again, to a certain degree, just as a function of capacity and 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 um, and time and prodding, um, we've done things the same way we've done them for a long time. So I, I'm really excited about some of the innovation that I'm going to see from his group. Well, and particularly with you know climate change, you just see much more unexpected weather phenomena. I mean, you don't see the you know the bridges in New York freezing in November right. and jamming the whole city up. I mean, that is not mm. in our whole life. You don't see that. I can't remember two or three times when that happened. Right. right. So, but we but we could tomorrow we could have a 1996 snowfall, uh, and and we would be going 24 seven, and it would still be a mess. And you know we we're we're, we're doing our best to. To, to meet expectations, to learn and grow, and as always, balance that with the amount of with the amount of money that we can collect from folks who are paying the bills. Talk about money for a second. Yeah. The other thing that you hear echoing around the community is the increased property taxes. Yep. I've seen. Yeah. You know, I don't even. I don't live in the city. I'm in the county, but I'm paying a lot more property tax than I paid two or three years right. ago. What's your sense of? Why that's happening, and where's it, where's it going in the next couple of years? So, and and we spent a lot of time on the property tax issue. Uh, probably nine months ago, I assembled a group of. Uh, uh, both commercial and, and um, residential property owners. Uh, they formed what's called the Property Tax Working Group. 
And we've been we've been studying property taxes. We've been studying taxation statewide. We've had um, folks as varied as uh, Mike Cadis, who's now the retired director of the Department of Revenue, the guy who collects taxes for the state. Um, we've had legislators. We've had uh, we've had uh, retired city managers from jurisdictions where the local op option sales tax is in play, and we've heard a lot from the folks who are sitting at the table with us. Um, and these are, I, 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 I selected the folks who are serving on this group, uh, not not because I wanted them to make me feel better about property taxes, because I wanted to know what they were thinking and what they were experiencing. So we've got, um, we have folks who, uh, we, have a, we have a developer who, um, who's seen taxes double um, and in, in, on various properties and in, in some cases on mm -hmm. undeveloped properties he's seeing those taxes double um, there there are a couple of causes uh, the 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 really the primary cause of late and what what created a bunch of community sticker shock um, over the last couple of years was the reappraisal so the state has gone from a six-year appraisal cycle to a two-year appraisal cycle. Uh, so uh, some some properties were not uh, were not appraised um, for six years, or depending on where they were in the cycle, for mm -hmm. almost eight years. And as as we all know, um, values have changed over the course of eight years. And it's one thing to see those values on an incremental basis year over year, uh, but when you don't do that appraisal for six years, it's a big change. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people saw a big change as a function of this two-year appraisal cycle. So many of those people, in fact, saw that change that uh, a good portion, a proportion that we're not used to, went back to the Department of Revenue and said, wait a minute, I think I think this number is too high. And in many cases, either the state or the tax appeal board uh, said you're right and backed off, uh, backed off that value. Value backs off, uh, that means taxable value decreases, uh, and that means we collect less money. So as a function of our budget cycle, we were predicting a number that was X, and we ended up with a number that was X minus, uh, you know, a, a, about a million two. Um, and that's a big deal in a budget like ours. Mm -hmm. uh, we th we think, and what we're hearing from the state is that the two-year cycle will now sort of temper, right? Um, we're we're not anticipating a spike like we saw. Um, and what uh, one large uh, commercial property owner suggested to me was, you know, I, I have some expectation of two or three percent a year, and I, I can I can manage my business based on that, but I can't manage my business based on twelve, right. 12 or twenty right. or thirty or forty percent. Yeah. That keeps happening. They're going to call you. It's us, right? That keeps happening. They're going to call you. The sheriff is so, nodding at right. So, so my sense is, so my sense is, those things are, are <laughs> going to even out. And and d d despite the fact that I have a reputation for controlling many things, you don't uh, control that. Among among the things I don't control is is um, those property values. The the good news is property values are going up. The the bad news is you don't realize that value until until you sell. So um, so. If you're if you're mm. you, you know if you're using your property and intend to use your property for a long time, um, uh, you're not realizing that right. increase in value. On and you're also seeing it on the buy side too, because property is is going up and up and up here. Right. Right. What do you think you could do to uh, communicate to people in Missoula about this? Right. Because the biggest challenge is, is that. When there's no communication or when they see it as being, um, you know, a lack of communication, they're like, they just keep on echoing the same right. it's, claims. It, it's, it's, it's enormously challenging to communicate this stuff. For one thing, it is not sexy. Um, and and frankly, a lot of people don't care until until there is an event that triggers a, a, a bottom line issue, right? Mm -hmm. if, if the, the minute it hits my pocketbook, I really want to have some answers. Right. Um, and and the the system is complex. Um, we are but one of a number of taxing jurisdictions. 
uh, and our expenses continue to increase. But but the challenge for me, and I think the opportunity for me and for us as a community, is where is the new revenue? What what boat are we missing? And I, I will tell you again and again that I think the boat we're missing, not only as a city, but as a state, is is getting tourists to pay their fair share. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Right. Probably less than their fair share, but l- even less than their fair share would go a long way to help. More than us. their unfair share that Correct. they're paying right. Correct. Right. correctly. You know, if, if if we were if we were to if if, if we were enabled by the legislature to inst- institute a tourism tax, I believe that we would be able to reduce property taxes. Moreover, um, I would guarantee, as a function of putting that tax before voters, that there would be property tax relief built into it. And we've talked about. About this before, and I've always yep. said, as you travel around, you check into a hotel in almost anywhere in the country, yep. and you see a, a, a tax of 10, 12, 14, sometimes in New York City could be $30, yep. we're not in New York City, a night, and you pay it. You right. just factor it in, the room's 104 bucks, and the tax 17, so you're paying right. you know, $121 a night. It doesn't seem to be a painful thing to do. What is the opposition to that? Uh, the op- the opposition really comes at the state level, um, and and it is, I think it's as simple as this. If if you're a if you're a legislator representing a uh, a small community or um, or unincorporated residents um, anywhere in Montana who have to go to Missoula or Helena or Butte or Billings or Bozeman or Livingston or Kalispell or you you name the community to go to Costco or Walmart or right right any of those places they don't want to they they say they don't get anything out of paying that tax they're just enriching this community and, and why don't you exempt Montana residents from it well that, that's certainly an option but if you're if you're a legislator from one of those areas ain't ain't no way you're going to try to sell that to your constituents because they're having none of it so and the 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 way the legislature is constructed um there is there is a disproportionate there's disproportionate sure. representation among rural communities but even if it's limited to a bed tax they they would they have that same well the bed yeah. tax exists yeah it already exists right but it's not high enough well, and it and it and it only it only supports, there are others that would argue that it so, is so it only <laughs> supports tourism marketing right Right. And some state general funds. Right, but that could be adjusted. Abs- absolutely, yeah, yeah. It it is a heavy lift. I do not anticipate the Montana legislature legislature supporting a local local option tax for communities of our size. We're going to trot out a bill anyway. Um, my suggestion, um, and this is the boat we're floating, is uh, I would I would like I would like the legislature to consider an initiative. And if the legislature isn't interested in that, I'd like uh, I'd like a citizen an initiative to ask voters across the state whether they would support a, a 3% tourist tax that would go to reduce property taxes and let local jurisdictions vote on that. My hunch is that if I had somebody hunkered out of outside Fresh Market with a clipboard saying, uh, would you support a 3% tourist tax to reduce property taxes, we could get enough signatures to get that on the ballot. You just have to say reduce property taxes. <laughs> they won't read the <laughs> yeah. top part. They'll just sign right. it. And I mean, this is... This is um, I mean, in a in a perfect world, which ain't the place we live in, uh, we would have a tax system that wouldn't require cities to raise money through property taxes or to chase some of these additional revenues. But we have a far from perfect tax system. Um, so a sales tax, while regressive in nature, can be can be um, adjusted to minimize that regressive nature. And property tax is pretty darn regressive too so Mm -hmm. um, so in this imperfect world how do we find some good pieces that we can pluck and there is new revenue how many how many people is this state a year Mm. millions and millions about three million visit missoula you know a pearl jam concert is a wonderful thing but it costs us money right Missoulians don't it's funny Missoulians don't think about tourism right in their backyard they don't understand the impact they really don't. It's an education thing, and it, 
And there's value there. Sure, but they don't. I just, I just don't think people can cons- consider that this is a destination when they sure. compare themselves with Big Sky and Bozeman and, and it's becoming and, and, and it's becoming more of a destination for all sorts of reasons. Right, it not, is not the least of which it's cool. Uh, music. You, you add music to that mix. You mm-hmm. you add you add events at the university. You add a vibrant downtown. You add a shopping district. You add you, you, outdoor recreation, and you you got a we have a place here. And this place is a place where people want to be mm-hmm. and visit and spend money. You, you bring in one entrepreneur like Nick Chicota, right? And he creates this demand for there. There, there is a there is a, a an ecosystem of music here that did not exist and drawing people from other five places years ago. Here. Absolutely, and and what Nick's done is phenomenal. Well, you've got it there, right? But we've we've spoken to a lot of those folks on our show. We spoke to Andy Holler and the Merc. We've spoken to Drake Depke over at Socket Timmy. I mean, these are people coming into the market that want to real see a huge opportunity here the, in that space. The the you know the 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 story of two thousand eighteen is uh, were discovered and um, mm. and and investors are bullish on our place and they're and they're uh, and they're bullish for a reason right they're these aren't naive people they're they're not they're not um, no. folks who se- seize opportunities and and right. are gonna they're gonna come in here sell their wares slam the trunk and move to the next town these are people who are willing to invest and in, right. and and participate in the community because they believe in it you know I can tell you that it resonates around the country people people are shocked that we have in this community raised for the like for the old sawmill district project 24 million in foreign investment yeah. into Missoula mm. Montana right some people can't get that in Savannah Georgia or bit much bigger you know metrop you know metropolitan areas and we were able to do that here because we have a you know a good story to tell and there and there are good entrepreneurs here let me let me uh, let me let me talk about uh you said there were highs and lows let me talk about one of the lows that we're trying to deal with which is the uh, the decreased enrollment at the University yep. of Montana. That has a tremendous ripple effect. If you have three, four, five thousand less students here yep. than you did four or five years ago, those are, you know, in some people's minds, those are just consumers that have left the community yep. that were spending a lot of money here. Mm-hmm. What what does the city see as its role in trying to facilitate a, uh, you know, a resurgence at the university? So, so to a certain degree, um, my job is to meddle. And and uh, that that work is made much simpler when someone is receptive to the meddling, and Seth Bodner is receptive. Um, Seth and I meet regularly. I meet with his staff regularly, and we're working closely on not only some planning efforts, um, particularly around. Uh, we're working on some planning efforts, particularly around uh, expanding campus, really, and looking at looking at the University of Montana not as a place with boundaries, um, but as an as an opportunity for for town and ground town and gown to work together. Um, so we're talking about this innovation corridor where um, where we plan together, uh, we invest together. And um, and we succeed together. Uh, we're having conversations um, around uh, how do we better use the the remarkably talented faculty, staff, and students of the University of Montana to move the community forward. Um, we we at the City of Missoula contract with consultants all day long to help us get work done that we don't have mm-hmm. capacity to do in-house. There's a ton of expertise at the university, and we're working on creating an arrangement whereby we can uh, we can uh, tap into that. Really contract with the University of right. Montana to get that work done. Um, so Students have a students have a experiential learning opportunity. They're also talented and smart. They're thinking of things that we don't think of. Um, they get paid, which um, helps a lot. We have faculty members who are who are serving as the uh, project managers. They bring expertise. They also they also get experience sort of outside of the academic realm um, that that doesn't cost them. They don't need to go anywhere for that experience um have, have we put up a finger on what happened 
Is there is there a general consensus consensus on what drove enrollment down? Because uh, I have an opinion about that myself. That's not analytical, but I can I can only speak for myself. I think. Um, I th I think that I think that in crisis the University of Montana uh, found itself not taking care of fundamental stuff. Um, you got to answer a student's email when they inquire about going to school at your university. You 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 have you have to be responsive to people your customer base. You have to acknowledge them and you have to attract them as customers. And in in crisis mode, investment in recruitment, investment in enrollment, investment in those basic services I think went by the wayside. Uh, Seth, Kathy Cole and his team are working to rebuild that. Um, and some some of it's as fundamental as having the right software to ensure that, right. that you're you're managing those relationships with prospective students. Um, part of it is systemic. You, you 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 have to as as I hope we do here at the city of Missoula, build a culture wherein um, I'm I'm in the business of serving my community, and if you want to have a meeting with me, you're going to have a meeting with me. I may not be able to help you, but I'm going to acknowledge your pain and and I'm going to do my damnedest we need to do that for students as well students need to feel embraced and wanted and appreciated mm. and respected and that takes that takes time and money and it and it takes it takes a shift in culture and when you're when you're running 14,000 strong um, there is a chance that you're going to start taking your student body for granted and you're going to behave in ways right. um, that it's nothing nefarious it's human nature right yep. and so when when it's easy you act easy um and and when it gets when it gets hard you can't act easy i think you also can't discount the the, uh, the social media effect of the book I, you know? I i don't think you can discount any of that i mean there 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 became a there became a narrative around a university in crisis and 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 when that is the only narrative, it's it's really hard to it's really hard to sell your product. Mm. Yeah, um, I can tell you the University of Montana ain't a Titan ain't the, ain't the Titanic, and there's no iceberg waiting. No, what what the the opportunity here is huge. This university has a ton to offer, and I think Seth and others are recognizing that not only not only as an institution do they have much to offer, but they happen to be in a community where people want to be. You combine those two things, and you tell that story it's pretty damn powerful and we, you know we talked about this before but the uh, the montana state is doing an exceptional job with their contact management and their marketing right to your point right so we have a the, in state you have a big you know there's a there's a lot of competition yep. and they've got to up their game here to compete Fine. with them and it, but in fairness uh, and I'm not always, you know, fair when I think about this. But in fairness, they offer a different curriculum over there, and they're still seeing some of the uh, the, the benefits of all the oil field activity for their engineering school and mm -hmm. for some of those other sorts of things that they and their ag business and that that has, you know, those things ebb and flow. We have devalued what we. We have devalued we're, we're what we teach it. at the University of Montana, right. and we should not devalue exactly. it. Right. Fritz Landman at ClassPass will tell you all day long that he's not hiring engineers from Bozeman. He's hiring liberal arts graduates from the University That's of right. Montana because they can think, they can have conversations with real human beings, they're creative, they adapt, sure. and they want to do Critical good thinking. things. Tom, you know, Tom Sturgis, of his 130 Absolutely. employees, 100 are UM graduates. And right. Arnie, the one thing is, you know, my son's a senior. He is applying to schools right now. They're beating down his doors from Montana State. I haven't seen much paperwork come from U of M. And that totally needs to change. And Kathy, I think, is all over that. Unfortunately, like all of our institutions, um, we we don't turn on a dime. And, right. and I think what Seth and his team um, and, and UM supporters in the community are interested in doing is giving them, giving them as much help as we can in 
in helping and in, in allowing them to be agile. Um, and there, there's a there's a finite window here, right? In terms of um, the, the, there are things that need to be turned around, and I don't think there's any anyone more aware of that than Seth Bob. Right, exactly. And and that sense of urgency is is what will what will ensure that this institution is restored to its glory. Sure. You know, it's an interesting um, sidebar to, to all of this, and, um, and I wanted you to, to speak to you from your journalistic background. It used to be newspapers were very influential. Yeah. And in some places they still might be, even with all the mantra of fake news, and et cetera. But social media sets the <laughs> agenda now. You know, I didn't know anything about um, problems with, the, you know, sidewalks in Missoula until... You know, I go on a social media, uh, you know, portal, and there's all these stories about it. And the headlines kind of set for a lot of people what the issue is, yep. whether it's substantive or not. How do you interface? How do you, pay, you know, do you pay a lot of attention to that? Do you try to engage with that and interface with it to help set that, that tone? Because once that's out there, then you're all in a defensive mode trying to refute what, what may not, in fact, be true at all. Right. Uh, and, and I think therein, therein is the problem, Arnie. Um, if, if uh, so I, I visited Google. Uh, I googled how do I get rid of my Facebook account because I didn't happen to have a young person in immediate uh, proximity to tell me how, uh, and I deleted my Facebook account. Um, I, I I rarely used it. I may have posted a few things over the years, had one for the campaign. I got rid of both of them. Um, in 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 part um, as a as a minuscule and likely meaningless protest over um, the use of, of folks' data for I think uh, nefarious purposes, uh, but at the end of the day, uh, uh, if I spent any time on Facebook, I would be distracted all day, and I would I would be I would be mm -hmm. I would be working on extinguishing um, extinguishing fires that did not exist. Uh, I would rather spend my time. Um, acknowledging real-world conversations and and the the facts as I know them, and manage right. accordingly. And I think the long arc, fa Facebook is this Facebook is this this tiny slice of time that um, something flares and then it subsides. It's 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 a it's a tiny tide and it goes in and out relentlessly. What's so funny is I talked to my nieces and nephews who are in their 20s and I talked about Facebook and they said we don't even use Facebook they, they're all into Snapchat and Instagram and, Instagram and these all other sources it's almost like you know you wipe out one infestation, and then there's this other social media infestation. There, there, there's going to be another thing. What I what I will tell you is that I um, I uh, I have an Apple News feed, um, and and most of what I'm paying attention to is New York Times and Washington Post, um, and I have a I have a Twitter account and. Um, and I follow who I follow. The, fa the fact of the matter is, though, that I know that that Twitter account is is giving me a picture that's skewed to my interests it's and my curated. biases, right? right? And and so I I can put no more stock in that than I can in lots of well, other sources. I, and I I see that as the challenge of social media. When you used to get a newspaper every day, you'd read it from co I would read it from cover to cover, and you would read things that you, that weren't programmed for you to read. The, yeah. fundam the fundamental principle that I learned in journalism school was fairness. Right. That ain't that. That is not impartiality. <laughs> right. Right. It, it's not. Um, but it is fairness. Right. And I learned news judgment. Right. So so in this in this finite space, um, on on this on this uh, on this twenty four hour cycle. Uh, based on what I know about my community, my education, uh, the the trained people around me, what's most important for me to tell the people tomorrow? 
Well, what's interesting about that, and you know, trained journalists, you learn this, you you know where you can get fair, you know, information. It really has changed from just even a couple of presidencies ago, putting aside personal politics and all of that, from having, you know, John Kennedy or, you know, Richard Nixon or, you know, any, any of Jimmy, any, any of the presidents from either party, you would get their understanding of policy from their team. You would, you know, Secretary of State or their, they would do it when they did a press conference once a month or, you know, not very often yeah. when they did the State of the Union address. We now have a centralized tweet system yeah. that is every single morning there's five, six, seven tweets from the president and it captures, you know, the news cycle right. every single day. And that's such a huge change from the way a thoughtful laid out strategic kind of way of doing things what do you see as the effect of this well so so for me the effect is that that we we we, we stop we don't we don't pay attention to the long game right the long arc i believe is the way martin luther king described it right um we everything is a slice, and we react. We react, we react and adjust to the slice. I am glad no one can read my mind because I, I, I. There are a lot of iterations that come into play before I decide where to have lunch, let alone how I decide whether or not we're going to move forward with a sidewalk project. Um, the 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 decision making process, the public process, takes time and. And if we and if we just slice little bits of that process apart, um, it looks ridiculous. It looks confused, um, and and it doesn't make a great deal of sense taken as a whole. You can you can start to see the larger picture. So so you know whether it's whether it's any president who who were to type whatever is on his or her mind at any given moment all day long would would probably not present particularly well there may be some exceptions to that but um, but this impetuousness um, and our Im our impatience and and the this notion that um, that uh, uh, there, there needs to be a, a scoop, and we need to understand every turn of the screw. Well, uh, it drives advertising. Right. Mm -hmm. It drives. The, the interesting thing, Andrea, we're just looking at is Missoula. Uh, Facebook is is uh, with the Rockefeller Foundation is is giving a million dollars to a local nonprofit here in Missoula. Okay, so the the thing about Facebook or Instagram, all these things, is it's how you use the medium. In many ways, right. it's how you program to the medium and publish to the medium. Yeah, but but it does Im, 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 you know impact in in a different way than ever before. You never had a president of the United States go on a rampage against like John Tester, right? You know, on a daily basis, and and not only on a rampage, no, but no. call him liar, John, and all this kind of stuff. It's just it's unprecedented on how to. He's unprecedented uh, on every level, though. Like his message and his medium. Right. And that's where he's used Twitter so effectively. The thing is this, is that he uses it well, right? Because otherwise, it's like everyone's waiting for that buzz in their pocket at 5 in the morning. Because it's 7 in the morning when he does it, or 3 in the morning, to see what he's going to say. But he dictates the well, it does, um, He does suck all the air out of the room. But, yeah. but the point for me in talking with John is you're a mayor. You're a mayor of a city. <laughs> you know, the president shows up here. He attacks local people. He leaves. He continues to do things that affect Missoula, Montana directly. How, how do you, you know, deal with that? I continue to show up every morning with my mantra, what am I going to do to make somebody's life better today? And sometimes that takes, sometimes that's a, that's a big, long deal. Sometimes it's a matter of hearing somebody out on an issue that's completely personal to them and I can't affect. Um, the interesting thing, for better or worse, is that all of, all of that noise has very little effect on the way I do business here in Missoula, Montana, and the way we do business here in Missoula, Montana. What has 
changed since you took office at the beginning of how you do business? What has changed? Yeah. Uh, well, social media has certainly changed. Um, has has changed our work because we do end up um, on occasion uh, something rises to the level that's beyond distraction, and you got to deal with it, right? Um, and and that it takes time and resources to, to deal with that stuff. Um, in, in some ways, there's more communication. In some ways, some people are more engaged, and I, that's great. There, there, there's an upside to all of this as well, and that is um, I think more people are paying attention to local government. Um, more people are aware of goings on um, because of these social relationships mm. and, and this this interface on a sure. screen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, what what has what has changed uh, in in terms of the way we do business is um, that social media hasn't changed much of that. Uh, what has changed is um, my my understanding of how much time it takes to get things done, when to be patient, when to be impatient, uh, when when to uh, when to be ahead of the folks I serve, and when to follow them a little bit. Um, you know, it, it it turns out experience matters in this work. I'm a much different mayor than I was when when I took office in 2006. Um, I have more patience for some things and less for others. Uh, but it, it it it's it's always different. It's always interesting, and there are always opportunities for us to do better. What what I, you know, the silver lining of sending somebody a notice that they're going to pay forty thousand dollars for a sidewalk is that um, once I apologize to them for causing them pain and stress, is that I now I now am acutely aware that we have an opportunity to do this one thing better. And for our listeners, why don't you explain the sidewalk issue? Sure. So, so since time immemorial, um, as the city has has built its sidewalk network, we've relied in no small part on adjacent property owners to help pay the freight. Um, and and this this latest project, and we've been doing these projects for years. I've been a part of them as both a council member and certainly as mayor. Um, we we propose these sidewalk projects. They're based on a master plan. Uh, that that uh, master plan gets in- implemented in stages. Uh, this particular stage. Um, in in our slant street neighborhood the the combination of the size of lots and uh the the bidding environment and the cost of materials and labor has has taken a has has taken these projects where i could count on an adjacent property owner to agree sometimes grudgingly um, and sometimes very willingly to make an investment of a few thousand dollars to 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 complete this infrastructure or repair it right for the public good and and to the benefit of their property um, we we've gotten beyond uh, asking folks to help us in 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 those numbers um, to forty thousand dollars in one case on a corner lot uh, for a couple who are both on social security and work part-time and um, and it's an opportunity for me to to say, look, we've done this, we've done this this way forever. Um, I don't think it's going to work anymore, and so mm. let's figure it out. And and it, and and today, you know, we we had we had council members, I think, asking excellent questions about the program and how we ought to move forward. And we had citizens coming to us expressing. You know, s- certainly dismay at the fact that you know this bill lands in their mailbox with a thud, uh, but also giving us really thoughtful responses and asking really thoughtful, critical questions about.
about how we move forward. Um, and I think we can take all that, and I think at the end of the day, we're going to come up with something way better. Good. We're heading into 2019. What what are the headlines of your agenda for the city of Missoula for this next year? Uh, uh, city of Missoula and University of Montana um, uh, celebrate turnaround in enrollment. Uh, city of Missoula and University of Montana announce joint planning on campus and Broadway corridor. Uh, city of Missoula uh, improves. Uh, service in public safety through police and uh, 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 through police response. Um, City of Missoula continues to work with agencies to address those fundamental issues of homelessness, of hunger, of addiction, and of uh, folks in mental health crisis. I mean, it is a it is a watershed to me, a point in history where you have to be discussing warming shelters in a city like Missoula, Montana. I mean, how as a mayor do you deal with? I mean, you just mentioned you know the addiction issues and the homelessness issues, and how that as an anchor on a community is is so you know weighty for for us to deal with that. Well maybe maybe I'll maybe I'll step back and amend my previous answer yeah. with regard to what has changed over the course of my tenure. One of those things is that the federal government has continued to abdicate its responsibility uh, with regard to taking care of people in basic ways and and we're left to fill those holes. Um, and and we are traditionally not well equipped to fill them. So so we're making adjustments in the way we do business, either through partnerships with uh, with not for profits or for profits. In some cases, um, we're making staffing adjustments. Uh, you know, our office of housing is not just about uh, is not just about making sure that that uh, a young working family has the opportunity to buy a first home, um, that housing office is also engaged in making sure that um, your home is not a gutter, right? Um, so so we're, doing, we're doing more soup to nuts stuff. Um, that happens uh, certainly within our organization and our partner organizations. The City County Health Department is, is, has had to change the way it does business. Um, we participate along with many partners in the Partnership Health Center. Um, so, so we've had to make lots of those adjustments. And while I, you know, in, 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 a, in a world where I had uh, more control, um, we wouldn't we wouldn't be having a conversation about a warming shelter because folks would folks mental illness would be treated, their addiction would be treated, their poverty would be eliminated, their bellies would be filled, and they would be able to participate fully in their communities. Right. But barring all of that, um, we're we're going to do triage until it gets better. You know what? One one thing I want to ask you quickly about one of the things that we talked about at our last meeting was all the development that's going on in town. And that's just something that you're, you're quite proud of. I am. Um, and looking forward to 2019, what, is, what does it look like there in terms of new companies coming into town? You have a new head of the MEP. You have um, that are going to attract new businesses. You talked a little bit about housing in town and how to accommodate for the increased workforce that's, you know, starting to work in the downtown area. So if you could just talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so so tw- I think 2019 is pretty exciting on a, on a lot of fronts, uh, not the least of which is I, th- I think that that um, that that faith that um, the business community and residents have um, is not going to waver in our future. And so I think we're going to continue to see that sort of investment. When I say we're when I say we're discovered, um, a piece of that is I, I think uh, I think these companies um, who uh, who uh, use um, 
uh, who, who employ the talents of folks who graduate from the University of Montana, who recognize the value of our workforce, who recognize that when you have a workforce that's happy because they live in a nice place, um, we're discovered in that way. If you're, if you're, uh, and I keep trotting out class pass because Fritz and I had a direct conversation about this, and the question was why in Missoula, and among among the things I learned from him is that we have we have a heap of competitive advantages, um, not the least of which is that workforce mm -hmm. issue. Um, uh, the, the fact that the place is cool, that there's there are recreational opportunities, um, and the fact that he doesn't have to compete. You know, while our median home price is two hundred eighty-five thousand dollars, give or take, and that's too much. Um, it ain't eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars, which is what it is in Seattle, or I, I hesitate to even think what it is in the Bay Area, or, um, or New York, New Jersey. Right, and 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 my employee here. Here in Missoula, um, is is not going to walk across the street to Google and get an offer that's a nickel more than mine, and I'm going to lose that person because of a nickel. Uh, I'm going to get employees who love this place, want to be part of the community, are willing to work an honest day for a fair wage, and make an investment in the place. Um, I we're going to trot out a, a housing policy for the Missoula City Council to consider. Um, I think we have some some ideas that are going to help move the needle a bit, help us create inventory, um, and that inventory should help folks, that should help lift folks up. It should help folks get, get on an ownership track. It should help folks who um, either choose to rent or are renting until they can buy. We're going to give them some better opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to build stuff in the right place so that our infrastructure gets appropriately sized and used. Um, you can rely on some of the other interesting banks. organizations here, like MoFi, right. Dave Glazer, right. and right. his loan program. You know, right. mortgage right. loan program. You know, we're going to see interesting things in the Sawmill District. We're going to see interesting things downtown. We're going to see interesting things on the Brooks and Reserve corridors. And the most important thing, I think, to all of the health of this, is the class class and the forecast and. Uh, Advanced Technology Group and all these companies are paying higher wages. They are paying higher wages. They're creating, they're paying living wages. And, and even better than living right. wages. And as, cases. you know, I've, I've told you gentlemen before, and uh, I'll never forget the day someone suggested it to me, um, they were being snarky, but they were also right, and that is um, uh, you, you can afford just about anything if you can pay for it. Right, right. So if you're right. if you're making enough money, um, the two hundred eighty thousand dollar median home price is is not out of reach. So if we can align wages and home prices, we're mm -hmm. going to get somewhere. Right. Um, we have, and and we, you know, I continue to have folks visit my office who who want to help. They want to make change. They want to fully engage in their place. And when you have a community like that. Um, you have a community that is willing to tax itself for more open space. When we hear about bond fatigue and property taxes, you have a community that's willing to build schools. You have a community that's willing to build parks and libraries. That's a pretty good place mm -hmm. to be. And you're running a pretty good place. Well, I, <laughs> it's the last I, best place. Yeah. I work with I work with a remarkable community, a remarkable staff, and. This, as I always say, is a wee business, and I, I get, I get a ton of help, um, and once in a while I get something right. <laughs> John Mayer, <laughs> it's Richard always Guitar. good. <laughs> it's always good talking with you, catching up, and in uh, a few months as we uh, as we move into 2019, we hope we can come back and talk to you more about the things that uh, are important for uh, Missoulians to know. Would love that. It's always a pleasure talking with you, gentlemen. You too. All right, Arnie, I'll see you tomorrow. Oh, no, I won't see you. I'll see you next year. See you next year. All right. Bye-bye. Wow. Thank you to Director of Communications, Ginny Miriam, and Mayor John Angan for today's interview. Arnie and I were pleased to speak with Mayor Angan and talk about a review of the year 2018, as well as what to look forward to in 2019. This marks our last show of the year, and Arnie and I look forward to joining you again in 2019 right here on News Talk KGVO, AM 1290 and 98.3 FM. 
Have a happy holiday and a great new year. Thank you for listening to What Do You Know? I can't wait for the next show, Scott. I'm excited too, Arnie. If you'd like to suggest a guest, send me an email at scottrichman at townsquaremedia.com. We'll see you next week. And thanks for listening to News Talk KGVO, 